Hey everybody, Dr. A here, and in this video, we're going to be exploring an example of axial deformation. So given to us, we have an axially loaded bar supporting a uniformly distributed axial load, and we're being asked to compute the elongation of the free end, and we're also being told that the product of the cross-section area and the modulus elasticity is constant, so AE is constant. Now our given diagram shows this axially loaded bar that's two feet long. The free end is A and the fixed end is B. And it's subject to this uniformly distributed axial load along its length and that has a magnitude of 0.12 KLF. So that's kips per linear foot. So that means that every linear foot of this bar is experiencing 120 pounds or 0.12 kips. That's where we get 0.12 kips per linear foot. So to get started, we're going to write solution here. And um, I like to start by writing our governing equation. So our governing equation for axial deformation at the free end of a bar is going to be equal to what? Well, it's some form of force times length divided by A times E. Well, the version of it that we're gonna use here is actually gonna be the integral version of that formula because we have a uniformly distributed load and we're gonna to have to find a function for our internal force. So I'm gonna write the integral version of our handy formula, integral from zero to L, N as a function of X over A as a function of X, E as a function of X, dx okay so again this is the integral form of that formula pl over ae or you may know it as fl over ae now in the integral form everything inside the integral can be expressed as a function of x so n is the normal force as a function of x a is the cross-section area as a function of x and e is young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity as a function of x. Now, we were told in the problem statement that AE is constant. So I can pull that outside of the integral as one over AE and then times the integral from zero to L in as a function of x dx. And make a note, this is not in times x, this is in as a function of x. So what we need to do is write the internal normal force as some function of x for this uh, given system. Now, if you notice, we were not given an X coordinate. Whenever you have a problem that is not providing you an X coordinate or, or what's called a location variable, just define your own and define one that makes your calculations go pretty smoothly. So how about we say A is the origin and we say things pointing to the right are a positive X value. Now defining that free end A in this problem as our origin and taking to the right as positive will help us avoid having to calculate an external axial reaction at B. We could calculate that if you wanted to know what this external axial reaction is at B. You can get it, that's no problem, but we don't have to if we make our origin at A and point uh, to the right as positive. So let's do a method of sections operation here and write that internal normal force as a function of X. So I'm gonna draw a free body diagram of a left cut section of our system. And in that free body diagram, I'm gonna draw on here the, um, the distributed axial load. That's the 0.12 KLF. And I'm making a cut at what distance? What is this distance gonna be? Is it two feet? Is it one feet? What is it? Well, it's a variable length of X, okay? Variable length of X. Now, what shows up at that cut section? Well, you have your internal normal force, that's what we're ultimately trying to get as a function of X. Now, technically, a uh, shear force is gonna show up here, an internal shear force and an internal bending moment are also gonna show up here. But if you notice, this is an axially loaded bar. That means the applied load only lies along the longitudinal axis of the bar. So you can go ahead and immediately say that the internal shear force is zero and the internal bending moment as a function of X is zero. And you could even prove that by showing some equilibrium calculations, summing forces in the X direction and summing moments about the cuts will give you those two are zero. So what we're really interested in is that internal normal force. So I'm gonna say some of the forces 
in the x direction equals zero, taking things pointing to the right as positive. So that's gonna give me minus 0.12 KLF, or kips per linear foot if you wanna write that out, times the distance over which it's distributed, which is a distance x, and then plus n as a function of x equals zero. So again, be careful. This is 0.12 times x, but this term right here is n as a function of x. And the negative out in front on the 0.12 KLF times x is because the 0.12 KLF is pointing to the left here, and we said things going to the right are positive. So doing some rearranging here, we're gonna get n as a function of x equals 0.12 KLF times x, okay? Now that's a linear function, right? This has the form of y equals mx. This is a linear function, okay, with a slope of 0.12 and an independent variable of x, all right? So now we're ready to substitute our function into our integral uh, form of our deformation equation. So we're gonna say the deformation, the elongation of point A is gonna be equal to one over AE times the integral from zero to what? L, but in this case, L is two feet of that function, 0.12 KLF times X DX, okay? Now that's a pretty uh, easy enough integral to evaluate. If you evaluate this, you get one over AE, you can't forget about that constant, one over AE times 0.06 x squared evaluated from zero to two feet. Now, if you're wondering where the units went, the units are still there. That 0.06 is still carrying units. Didn't mean to jump up there. That 0.06 is still carrying units of KLF, okay? So that KLF is still built in here, 0.06 KLF times x squared evaluated from zero to two feet. Now you uh, substitute in your upper limit minus your lower limit, and you'll end up getting delta A equals 0.24 kip times feet all over AE. Okay, now how did I get kip times feet here? Well, remember, as I just said, the 0.06 is still carrying units of KLF. Now, when you substitute in that upper limit here of two feet, you get two squared is four, but that's two feet squared. So that's four feet squared. So your units end up becoming KLF, kips per foot, times feet squared. That's where you get kip times feet in that numerator. Now, um, because that came out positive, it turns out that's going to be a deformation to the left or an elongation. Now, again, I want to emphasize our units. Let's talk about these units very quickly because it's important to know what happens here. This is a deformation. So the, the units of deformation overall should be units of length. Right, So it should be units of like feet or inches or some unit of length. Where do the units of length come from in this expression? I mean, we've got kips times feet, which is not really a moment. That's, that's not a moment. Don't be confused by that um, in the numerator. And then we have this constant AE in the denominator that we don't have values for. So let's do a little unit analysis here. Our deformation units... So delta A has units of, if we look at what we have here, that numerator is carrying units of force times length, okay? Now, what is this denominator carrying units of? Well, area has units of length squared. What does Young's modulus have units of? Well, Young's modulus has the same units of stress, so that would be force per length squared, right? Units of stress are force per unit area, which is the same thing as force over length squared. So if we look at how these units can kind of combine or cancel themselves out, in this denominator, you have units of length squared canceling with length squared. So then that has you remaining um, with units of force times length divided by units of force. Now, 
what happens here? Well, those units of force cancel, and so you have a remainder of units of length, which is what you should have for deformation. So even though the way this final answer looks seems a little strange, you have a, a value of 0.24 that the numerator is carrying the units of kips times feet, but remember, area has its own units, length squared, E has its own units, force per length squared. So if you had input values of area and length, these units would cancel each other out and you would end up with final, final units of just the length, which is what you would expect for a deformation. So it goes back to these units of kips times feet. Those are the units associated with just the numerator term. So we say the 0.24 carries the units of kips times feet, but area has its own units and E has yet again its own units. So again, our final answer for this particular problem is given here 0.24 kip feet over AE and that's a deformation to the left. So this concludes this video. Uh, if you found this helpful, please hit like and subscribe.